In this video, I want to introduce the concept of phased arrays. And actually, the name kind of says it all. An array just means that there are multiple sensors arranged in some configuration that act together to produce a desired sensor pattern. And with a phased array, we can electronically steer that pattern without having to physically move the array, simply by adjusting the phase of the signals to each individual element. Now, commonly, an array is made up of antennas, like for wireless communications and for radar. But the general concept can be applied to different sensors, as long as they measure or emit waves, such as microphones, which are used for sonar and acoustic imaging. In each of these applications, we have to form a beam, and we have to be able to move that beam around. And we can do that with phased array systems. So I hope you stick around for this introduction. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. To begin, let's start with a single antenna instead of an array. Let's assume this is an isotropic antenna, which means that it radiates equally in all directions. In the Basics of Radar Tech Talk series, which is linked below, we talked about how this is not an ideal pattern for a lot of radar applications, and we would rather have a narrow beam. And one way to create a narrow beam is to redirect the energy with a dish. And radar dishes are a great design, and there are many applications where they are the ideal solution. Like, for example, the rotating dishes that you find for weather radar, and the commercial dishes that are on people's roofs for satellite TV and internet. However, they aren't ideal for all applications, and specifically for fast steering applications. Steering the beam requires the dish to physically rotate. And not only does this require gimbals and joints that need to be maintained over time, but having to move mass around is relatively slow. You could probably imagine that you're not going to gimbal the dish back and forth between two targets in a few milliseconds. But this is one area where an array of smaller antennas is beneficial. With phased arrays, the beam steering is done electronically. So not only does this mean that there are no moving parts, but we can steer the beam to a new target in a fraction of a second. And not just this, but phased arrays can also be used to generate multiple beams, each that are steered independently from the other. And this is all done using a single array. So with that being said, let's look at how we can actually form a narrow beam with an antenna array and how we can steer that beam through phase shifting. Let's go back to our single isotropic antenna and we'll just look at half of the pattern. The antenna is radiating out a sine wave where the dark lines are where the signal is high and the light lines are where the signal is low. Now, this antenna has no directivity since it radiates equally in all directions. But imagine we have a second antenna that is placed half a wavelength away that is also radiating out the exact same sine wave. Now, I know that this is a bit hard to see like this, but I want to explain a few parts of this image because it's important for understanding how the array works. Along the horizontal axis, we can see that the two waves are exactly out of phase with each other, since the light part of one overlaps with the dark part of the other. This means that when one signal is high, the other is low. And when we combine those two signals, they cancel out, and we're left with very little energy in these directions. However, if we look up in this direction, we can see that the two signals are almost perfectly in phase with each other. The light lines up with the light, and the dark with the dark. This means that both signals are high or low at the same time and they constructively add in that direction. This means that the interference pattern that results from these two antennas looks something like this. In this image, the dark areas are where the signal is canceled out off to the side and the colored portion is where the signal is stronger. So we can see that even with just two antennas, we already have a more directional beam than we did with a single antenna. Now, this isn't a very sharp beam, and we can see that a little more clearly if I zoom out a little bit. So if we want a sharper beam, we need to increase the aperture of the antenna, or the width of the array. And one way to do that is by simply moving these two antennas apart. Notice how the main beam gets narrower as I move the two antennas from half a wavelength apart out to 1.5 wavelengths. However, this has created some additional unwanted effects, like these two grating lobes. A grating lobe has a gain that is comparable to the main lobe, which can cause some trouble determining which beam a detection is coming from. So, instead of spreading out the antenna elements, 
we can increase aperture by adding more antenna elements, each at a spacing of half a wavelength. With three antennas, notice the main beam is narrower. But we also have two weaker side lobes that appear. Again, they're not grating lobes since they are much lower gain than the main lobe. All right, let's add more. Here is four elements, and the main beam is even more narrow. Here is six elements, and then eight elements. Each time, the beam gets narrower and we get more weak side lobes. Now, look at this beam. It's like a spotlight shining up into the sky. And what's kind of amazing about this is that all we've done is line up eight isotropic antennas in a linear array, and the interference pattern between them results in this really directed central beam. And that's pretty cool. Okay, so that is the basic principle behind how an array of antennas can create a directed beam. It is just the pattern that is created from the constructive and destructive interference between the different antenna elements. And as you can probably infer at this point, this pattern depends on things like the number of elements, the spacing between the elements, and the geometry of the array layout. These parameters contribute to the so-called array factor, which we're gonna talk about later. But the array pattern is also a function of the radiation pattern of each of the individual antennas. Now, I chose isotropic antennas for this pattern, but we could also have an array of antennas with other radiation patterns as well. And all of these different variables can be adjusted to modify the beam in a number of different ways. And to see this more clearly, let's jump over to MATLAB and open the Sensor Array Analyzer app. Now, this app can do a lot, and I've linked to information in the description below if you want to check everything out. But all I'm going to use it for here is to visualize some radiation patterns. And to start, let's duplicate the array we had earlier. We have eight isotropic antenna elements arranged in a linear array, each half a wavelength apart. And now let's plot the 2D array pattern. So this is showing the antenna gain as a function of azimuth angle at an elevation of zero degrees. So it's just the gain around the horizon. And notice that there is a high gain lobe that's in the direction of the bore side of the antenna array and several lower gain side lobes, exactly what we saw before. In fact, let's take this gain plot and overlay it on the other pattern. And we can see that they nicely line up. Now, there must be some side lobes here that are just too dim to see, but that's how low gain they are. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that these are two different ways of visualizing the radiation pattern. But I think the gain and azimuth plot is easier to interpret, so we're going to stick with it for now and just go back to the app. All right, so something that I think is really important to remember is that this is the gain for a two-dimensional slice at zero elevation. However, antennas send out radiation in three dimensions. And we can see what the actual radiation pattern looks like in 3D with this plot. And notice that instead of a nice, sharp main beam, the pattern is really this sort of snail shape where the main lobe extends both up and down from the horizon. So in order to create a sharper beam in two dimensions, you know, like a cone-shaped beam, then instead of a linear array, we need a planar array. MathWorks has a nice gallery here of different types of array geometries. There are the linear arrays that we started with, and we can bend a one-dimensional array to conform around a curved surface, like we have here with a circular array. But if we want the interference pattern to create a cone-like beam, and if we want to be able to steer that beam in two dimensions, then we need a planar array like this rectangular array, or really any other 2D shape, like a circle or an oval or a hexagon. And to show you what I mean, let's go back to the Sensor Array Analyzer app and change our geometry from a linear array to an eight by eight element rectangular array. See now how the main beam is shaped in two dimensions, and we have a number of smaller side lobes all around it. And what's really interesting still about this is that this pattern simply comes from how each of the individual antennas in the array interfere with each other. 
If you build an 8x8 array of isotropic antennas, each spaced half a wavelength from each other, and send the same signal to each one of them, this is the radiation pattern that will emerge. This is a good time to explain that the pattern of the entire array that we see here is the product of the array factor and the pattern of each individual element. The array factor is a function of how the array is set up. That is, how many elements there are, what their spacing is, and in which way they are oriented. And given those parameters, an antenna array has a specific gain pattern, which we call the array factor. For example, this is the array factor for a two element array spaced half a wavelength apart and with the same signal sent to both elements. Now I'm showing a back baffled array, which is why the pattern is only radiating out in the forward direction and it's not mirrored in the backward direction. So that's just something to be aware of here. All right, so this two element array that's spaced half a wavelength apart is going to provide six dB of gain or twice the power in the boresight direction, which makes sense since there are two antennas contributing to it. And then because of the interference pattern that we saw earlier, the gain is going to drop as the angle off boresight increases. Okay, so that is the array factor. Now let's talk about the element pattern. If the antenna elements are isotropic, then the element pattern has a gain of 0 dB in every direction. So the multiplication of the array factor and this element pattern produces an array pattern that looks like this. But what if we switch out the individual elements with, say, two ideal sync pattern elements instead? Well, what's interesting about this is that the array factor is the same, since it's the same array geometry but the element pattern is different. And when we multiply the array factor by this new element pattern, we can see that the total pattern for the new array is a much more directed beam. So hopefully you can start to see how the array geometry impacts the array pattern, as well as the pattern of the individual elements. And to sort of see this in action, let's go back to the sensor array analyzer app and switch the element from isotropic to an ideal sync pattern element. Now, the array factor has stayed the same, but since the sync elements are a more focused beam, the overall array pattern is more focused too. Okay, so we know we can form a static beam, but we want to steer this beam electronically. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back to the two element linear array and try to develop some intuition. Recall that this setup caused a cancellation of the two signals off to the side and a doubling of the signal along the bore site. And if we separate the two signals, we can see clearly that they are in phase with each other. Both of these patterns are identical. Now, instead of in phase signals, let's change the phase of the second antenna by exactly half a wavelength. So now the two antennas are sending signals that are exactly out of phase. And now if we bring them back to half a wavelength apart, we can see that we've changed how these two radiated patterns line up. Now the signals are doubled along the tangential axis where the light parts overlap and the dark parts overlap and are more canceled along the perpendicular axis where they are out of phase. And if we look at the combined radiation pattern for these two antennas, we see now that the strongest signal is off to the side and not in the direction of the bore site. So by phase shifting one signal by half a wavelength, we've essentially rotated the main beam by 90 degrees. Of course, we can delay the signal by any amount, and by sweeping through different phase shifts, we can see how the main beam sweeps back and forth. And to see this effect more strongly, let's go back to our eight element array. In this case, each antenna element is phase shifted compared to the element right next to it. So in this eight element array, there is a total of seven phase shifts between the first and last element. All right, hopefully it's starting to make sense that the array creates the beam pattern and the phase shifting steers that beam. And to see what all of this looks like in 3D with a planar array, let's go back to the sensor array analyzer app.
we'll go back to the pattern for an 8x8 planar array with isotropic antennas. And notice that the main lobe is aligned along the x-axis, or the bore side of the array. But now, under the steering tab, I can change the steering angle for the beam to something like 10 degrees in azimuth. And then the 3D plot shows what the beam pattern would look like. And notice that the main lobe has rotated by 10 degrees. And now I'll change the elevation angle to 10 degrees as well. And let me spin this around a bit and you can see that the main lobe is shifted both in azimuth and elevation. So hopefully we can start to picture what the radiation pattern looks like for the array if we shift the phase to each element in such a way that it produces these steering angles. Now, I want to show you how the main lobe changes and distorts as the steering angle increases well past 10 degrees. And to do that, I created a script that loops through and changes the steering angle from minus 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees. And this is the result. Watch the main beam. As I slowly increase azimuth angle, the beam rotates further from the bore site. But watch how right about here, it really starts to widen out and get distorted. Now, when the beam is near the bore site, it's a sharper beam than it is when it's steered further away. Again, all we're changing here is the phase to each element and not the array geometry itself. Anytime you try to steer too far from the bore site, the main beam gets a little more blobby and less sharp. Because of this, there really is only about 120 degrees of usable steering angle in both azimuth and elevation directions, instead of the full 180 degrees. So if you need a larger steering range, this is where things like multiple arrays oriented in different directions, or conformal arrays that physically curve, can become beneficial. Now, this is by no means the whole story of phased array antennas. And in the next video, we're going to continue talking about the larger concept of beamforming. We'll cover how we can go further than just transmitting and receiving a signal from a certain direction by doing things like forming multiple beams for multifunction radar and adapting the beam real time to maximize signal and minimize noise and other interferences. So if you don't want to miss that or any other future Tech Talk videos, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Also, if you want to check out my channel, Control System Lectures, you can find more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.